right, welcome into Surviving Paradise, the podcast that takes a sometimes serious, oftentimes humorous look at the claim by Jehovah's Witnesses that they are living in a modern day spiritual paradise. I am your host, Stacy Bauman, former elder, ministerial servant, and most importantly, a little guy, raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses throughout the 70s and 80s. Welcome into paradise this week. As I do a quick warning, we try to have fun here, lots of healing, but each episode inevitably features some sarcasm, humor, and my own brand of observation. Please note anybody that may be visiting or listening in, whether a regular or brand new, it is never meant to offend. We have respect for all groups, even if we might disagree. So again, welcome into paradise this week. Every time I turn this microphone on, I try to be cognizant of the fact that anything I share on this crazy show uh, regarding specifically my own experience as a Jehovah's Witness is colored by that particular place in time. I'm all too aware that depending on your age or your generation, our personal experience within the world of Jehovah's Witnesses, the paradise that is Jehovah's Witnesses, is heavily influenced by when and where you or I was exposed to this little organization. I often have to remind myself that the younger generation of witnesses or ex-witnesses that might be here listening may not be as familiar with some of the things that were part of my everyday life inside this little cult. And it includes big things and it includes little things. Little things, for example, like as a teenager in the late 70s and 80s, we used to love to work in preparing the food at the circuit assemblies for breakfast and lunch. Anybody remember that? Those were good times. Why, you might ask, why does anyone want to work on food? Well, it meant we got to hang out with our friends and miss that incredibly boring symposium that they were pumping out in the morning or afternoon. It was a chance to hang out with friends, laugh, and actually enjoy life. And it's highly likely that younger generations will never understand the stress we felt about getting to the circuit assembly early because you wanted in on one of those last cheese danishes. Once they were gone, yep, you were stuck with the heavily undesirable apple danish. <laughs> there was always a surplus of them. Cheese, it went early, better get there early. And how about Anybody out there that can remember the day and time when we used to have little rectangle food tickets we needed to give when we went up to the counter in the cafeteria, cafeteria area? Little tiny tickets that we used to hand that had 10 cents on them, if I remember right. It, it was a thing. <laughs> It was a thing, and I recognize that most of the younger generation, they're not going to really remember some of this stuff. And I tell you, just talking about that brings back some memories. I'm feeling a little bit nostalgic. Sipping on that warm orange juice and that poor man's egg McMuffin, who remembers I and that cute sister wondering what congregation she's from. Got to tell you, those were the days. Those were the days inside this little world of Jehovah's Witnesses as a teenager in the 80s. And I realize now, after that little rant, that I sound like the get off my lawn guy. <laughs> what can I say? Those were really special times, times that the younger generation just will not recognize or relate to. But as I move forward this week, I'm going to lean into my age a little bit here. When I look back at my Jehovah's Witness experience, there is something that is painfully obvious to me, and it has been for a long time. And I realize it might be difficult for a younger person to relate to. But again, it's so obvious to me and my generation. I'm going to lean into and unpack the fact that the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses has been dumbing down this religion for the past 20 to 30 years at least. And I think it's important to note here, I'm not trying to insult anyone when I say that. I'm the last one to do that. Please know that. Folks, I was an elder. I'm not particularly proud of that. 
And I was filled with all kinds of self-importance, a big, big view of the future and what I meant to it, believing I was on stage teaching life-saving truths to anyone that showed up to the Kingdom Hall and would listen to me. Trust me, I'm the last one to want to insult anyone. I would take hours preparing my talks, contemplating each word carefully for that next prayer I was asked to give from the platform. Remember those days when the council was to actually practice your prayers? True stuff. So I just want to get that out of the way early. I just insulted myself or threw myself under the bus and I deserve it. But note that when I talk about things of the past, particularly in reference to this organization dumbing things down to good people who are just looking for answers, it's never meant to be insulting. But with the benefit of hindsight, it's staggering to look back and see how they purposely, or could it be by accident or even ignorance, and I'll get into that, they've removed all pretense that Jehovah's Witnesses are wise, sage-like protectors of God's word, chosen by Jesus of the Bible personally to educate the rest of us lowly sheep living on this planet. The pretense is completely gone. It's really a strange dynamic for those of us old enough to remember the past. And honestly, 30, 40 years ago, uh, it's a long time ago, but it's not that long time ago. I want to dig into it, my own theories and what it all means, this observation. And I'll start here. I call the last couple of decades in God's organization the great dumbing down. That's right, the great dumbing down. So warning, there's sarcasm ahead. <laughs> I land on this subject because it has been absolutely unnerving for myself, and I can't believe I'm alone, to watch. And it's even more so for those in my age group or older. Now, for younger people, they may just shrug at all of this because the current world of Jehovah's Witnesses is all they've really ever known the last 20 years or so. But I'm here to tell you what you see today has not always been this way. There was a time when Jehovah's Witnesses felt like they were serious, very serious students of the Bible, of God's Word. It was a handwritten letter to them by his finger, by means of Holy Spirit. And we had that thought jammed down our throats for decades at the meetings and conventions. Who can remember unpacking this one? From the New World Translation at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, we get the following. It says, quote, But sanctify the Christ as Lord in your hearts, always ready to make a defense before everyone who demands of you a reason for the hope you have, but doing so with a mild temper and a deep respect. End quote. Now listen, for the younger generations or our younger friends listening in, would it shock you to know, to know that there was a time when someone would approach us, they would ask us a question about our hope, our beliefs as a Jehovah's Witness, and our answers were, uh, well, here, take this book out and check out JW Org. <laughs> we didn't used to do that. Approach a book card and ask a question today about their hope. And it's highly likely that it is the answer you will get. You're going to receive, well, here, check this book out and check out JW.org. That's the panned, or should I say canned, answer by Jehovah's Witness, Witnesses today on anything that is deep by anybody else's standards. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that wasn't really what the Apostle Peter had in mind in that verse when he was awash in Holy Spirit and counseling us to be prepared to make a defense before everyone that demands a reason for our hope. I don't think that's what he meant. I don't think he pictured book carts and a website. But the great dumbing down of Jehovah's Witnesses is so much more than just that. For some of us, 
that were really, we took it all seriously. There were some of us that did. I was one of those that were really serious J-Dub students. There was a time when we took the spiritual food out of New York very, very seriously. We would hang on every word, every announcement, every publication, every convention theme. We were there. We were in it to win it, and we were digging it. We wanted to understand. There was really, and hopefully some will hear this and know exactly what I speak of, there was really this aura that is really the only word I can come up with to describe it, that we were incredibly special and blessed because, well, uh, there's no other way to say it, we were smarter than everyone else. <laughs> Imagine believing that. I know, I know, but it's true. There was really this vibe, this aura, this deep-seated belief in all of us that we were special and we proved it by really digging in and being smart about everything we said and did. I could share countless stories of sitting at the feet of book study conductors as a kid, asking questions that were met with these long-winded, flowery answers I couldn't remotely understand at that age, but I was in awe of all sorts of numbers and dates that connect to a guy in Genesis who was bruising a snake in the head, who was then represented by a guy in Exodus, who was just an imperfect version of the guy that was the greater version, all pointing to a twig, something about Judah. That all led up to some walls coming down in Jerusalem. There was a fig tree withering away. It all pointed to the last days that would end before those born in 1914 could see it. Then some dragons, there's a slut riding a beast, and finally fire in the sky. And everyone who didn't believe that it was all connected being uh, killed while the rest of us watched. And well, we actually wanted to understand it all. We thought it was all so smart. We dug in on all of it. And with that, I've got to ask, do the younger generations do this today? I got to tell you, even as I was leaving 14 years ago, I didn't see it. I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say no, but I'm more than man enough to admit if I'm wrong, if someone wants to come at me with it. And it really, from where I sit, it makes my generation of Jehovah's Witnesses somewhat unique now in 2023. Look, sure, we had the ultimate pop star Jehovah's Witness in Michael Jackson, Madonna when she was hot, Prince when he was purple. But we also had this. The organization seemed smart. It seemed smart. The food coming out of New York was heavy on mysterious, albeit misguided and ridiculous information that we just felt we needed to study and understand. The Watchtower study was the meeting to be awake for. Jehovah's Witnesses in my day had to be students. We needed to defend our faith. We needed to read the literature and be prepared to be scholarly Bible teachers at every stop in our life. And well, that's all long gone. It's gone. I'm not going to say it's completely gone, but for the most part, the aura or the feeling or the vibe that we had in my generation, I just don't see it anymore. From my observation during those days, we believed we were eating at the finest spiritual steakhouse in the world. We really believed it. And by comparison, I look at today's Jehovah's Witnesses and they barely finish the cheeseburger and cold french fries in a McDonald's Happy Meal that is their meetings in literature today. Just give them the damn toy. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of. Just where's the toy? There just isn't any depth. There is not any depth. 
The pretense that we lived under in the past, that Jehovah's Witnesses were students of the Bible, immersed in three educational meetings a week, being transformed into ready-made scholars chosen by Jehovah himself, see John 6.65 in the holy book made only for Jehovah's Witnesses, that, that pretense, all of it, is gone. It doesn't exist among Jehovah's Witnesses today. I'm not going to say it's completely gone. There are pockets. I'm sure there are smaller groups that are equally studious people. But that vibe that enveloped the organization is gone. And look, I would just want to say here, I remember such hard-hitting awake articles like, Hi, I'm your spleen. It's not like that dumb stuff didn't exist before. It's always been there. But in my day, there was an effort or a pretense, and again, misguided, that we were deep. Oh, so deep. And we had rare insights. And I personally find it amazing, so few have noticed how much that has changed. And I don't think it's an accident. I left in 2009, February 2009, and I noticed the pretense of depth was already dissipating. And I saw it going away around 2000. It wasn't long after that whole overlapping generations fiasco, a watchtower study that uh, I got involved in, that things started to just back off and be dumbed down. I can't point to an exact date, but for me, it was around that time period, around 2000, that I personally began to witness, or at least be aware of, what I call the great dumbing down of Jehovah's Witnesses. And the result is seen today. Their governing body, in their endless quest for full control, successfully took their organization from a make-believe Ivy League school for all things end of the world into what looks like today a preschool where they're handing out crackers and Capri Sun juice boxes as spiritual food. And they did it gradually with only those who took it all seriously noticing that they were doing it at all. From the literature, to the meetings, to the conventions, they've been dumbing down Jehovah's Witnesses for at least two decades now. You're probably thinking, where is he getting this from if you can't relate? Well, let's take a look at what I mean by this. In the past, they were masters at creating confusion, making us all feel smart by following along, getting engaged. You likely know what is without question, it's probably just my favorite quote ever in reference and how I apply it to Jehovah's Witnesses by Friedrich Nitschke. You probably know it well, and I've thought about it a million times and continue to. You remember the great philosopher Nitschke said, quote, they muddy the water to make it seem deep, end quote. And I don't think there's a better quote to describe Jehovah's Witnesses. Ah, yes, the muddy but deep waters of truth coming out of New York? True? False? That confusion usually meant we would glob onto certain catchphrases, details, and more to come, of sounding and truly feeling like we were the best educated people on earth. Look at this water of truth. They muddy the water to make it seem deep. And I want to start with something that meant the world to me as a Jehovah's Witness. As I often do here, I chuck myself under the bus, admit my own mistakes, bad decisions, and whatnot, wherever I see applicable, not just for entertainment purposes. But the Watchtower study... The meeting itself, the magazine, the information found therein, and then, of course, as a Watchtower conductor, meant the world to me. Let's start with how much the Watchtower study and all the materials surrounding what they say is the most important meeting has completely tanked in the last two decades. To me, aside from an example I'll give later, Nowhere is the dumbing down of Jehovah's Witnesses more evident than the current fluff they serve at their self-proclaimed most important weekly meeting. And as I've shared here a million times, I was the watchtower conductor for roughly eight years as an elder. And as someone 
who loves to read and who actually enjoyed studying, I'll admit that I really enjoyed it all. And I prepared that Watchtower study as the conductor like my life depended on it every single week. I took it ridiculously seriously, which now that I look back on is absurd. <laughs> it's absurd. And it's painful to know that I wasted so much time. But in our quest to prove that the governing body is dumbing down their religion, take a look at what the shepherd, the flock of God, you know it, the secret elders handbook, has to say about the seriousness of the Watchtower study and the guy leading it. In chapter 6 of the super secret elders handbook, under Watchtower study conductor qualifications, we get this. Number one. The body of elders selects the watchtower study conductor. Since the watchtower is the principal means by which the faithful and discreet slave dispenses spiritual food, the conductor should be one of the best teachers on the body. He should also be one who has great freeness of speech. The body of elders may assign another elder to assist the watchtower study conductor. This brother would conduct in the assigned conductor's absence. End quote. Oh yeah, the Watchtower study is the principal means that a Jehovah's Witness is fed spiritual food. It's number one. So important was the Watchtower in its weekly meeting that even reading the paragraphs are of life and death importance. You remember, there'd be the conductor, then a man, and I do mean a man sitting next to him who would stand up to the microphone and read the paragraphs when he asked him to do so. Upon ending that, he asks questions and the audience gets involved. But so important was just reading at the Watchtower study, just the guy reading, that we get this back to the Shepherd book in the same section, chapter 6, quote, only. Exemplary individuals who read very well should be approved by the body of elders as paragraph readers. <laughs> if no brothers meet these qualifications, then qualified sisters may be used. Readers should be assigned in advance. It is preferred that the paragraphs be read live during congregation meetings. However, if no qualified readers are available, it is permissible to use audio recordings found on JW.org. End quote. Where do I begin? <laughs> At the risk of going sideways, did you sisters or former sisters know any of this? Uh, but I'm guessing like all of us, you sat through many Watchtower studies where the reader, blessed with male genitalia, fumbled his way through each and every paragraph. Yeah, I'm just going to say this now as an eight-year veteran of the Watchtower study. Don't hold your breath here, ladies. Not only will this never happen, but if it does, you'll be required to wear a napkin on your head because the angels are watching the Watchtower study too, and they might just get offended that someone with breasts is a better reader than the guys in the congregation despite the fact that their cousin angels couldn't even control themselves around you. You're so beautiful. Nephilim, floods and stuff. Unbelievable. And I just realized I probably gave them a title for the next Caleb and Sophia video. <laughs> Unbelievable. But back to the meat of that point, back to the Watchtower study, just reading it, reading the paragraphs, I should say, is a big, real big, so big deal. Fellow elders liken the Watchtower study to letters from Jehovah or the voice of Jesus. But as proof, there is this. From the Kingdom Ministry, November 1980, pages 1 through 3, part 1, congregation meetings. We get this, quote, Watchtower study. The Watchtower study could be likened to the main entree of a finely prepared five-course meal. It contains the solid food we all need to withstand trials and pressures. Are there any who are not experiencing such? Who then can afford to miss even one Watchtower study? Remember 
Neglecting our spirituality intensifies most problems. Remain firm in the faith. Attend regularly. End quote. But if that didn't land home and really put a spotlight on how serious the Watchtower study is, the March of 15th, 1989 Watchtower, pages 17 through 22, Insight Jehovah, Jehovah has given, is the name of the article, continues. It says, quote, the Watchtower is the principal instrument used by the slave class for dispensing spiritual food. Are you benefiting from it fully? Do you read each issue? And does your study program include looking up scriptures that are cited but not quoted? Do you also make it a habit to meditate on what you have studied, building up appreciation for it, considering how it should affect your attitude, your desires, your daily activities, your goals in life? Your doing so can be a big factor in your making decisions based on the genuine insight that Jehovah alone has given, end quote. If you weren't aware, as even I wasn't, uh, that's right, each watchtower and watchtower study and article are insights from Jehovah himself, as you just saw me read in print, heard me read. But look no further than the changes to the watchtower and the most important meeting of the week for proof that they're dumbing it all down. In January of 2008, Jesus, out of nowhere, decided his people were being overwhelmed with steak and potatoes, the main entree, and switched it all up by making one study edition of the Watchtower with a month's worth of spiritual snack food, and then made a second Watchtower for the public so they don't have to explain themselves. <laughs> My opinion. No, I'm not kidding though. This may actually be news to those that left several decades ago. Did you, were you aware of this? Can you imagine a world where they made one watchtower where they studied several articles throughout the month and there was a separate one for someone you might run into at school or your next door neighbor? From the July 2007 Kingdom Ministry, page one, under the aptly titled article, Exciting Changes for the Watchtower, we get this on the changes. Quote, earlier this year, congregations received a thrilling announcement. Starting in January 2008, the Watchtower will have two different editions, one for the public and the other for our Christian Brotherhood. Perhaps you've been wondering, how will the two magazines be different? What are the advantages of having separate editions? Are there any new features to look forward to? End quote. No, actually, as a longtime Jehovah's Witness, I'm wondering why Jesus waited until 2008 to do this. It's such a great change, though. No answer on that one, as always. But it continues, quote, The differences is the subheading. The issue dated the first of the month will be known as the public edition. All the articles in this issue will be prepared with the public in mind. The issue dated the 15th of the month will be known as the study edition and will not be offered in field service. It will contain all the study articles needed for one month, as well as secondary articles that are of particular interest to dedicated Christians. End quote. And I'll tell you, and for me, this is when I truly began to take notice that the dumbing down of all meetings and study materials had commenced and that it was gaining momentum. The Watchtower study, something that we were told was the premier meeting, the one you had to be awake for and well studied for, the one you should pay attention to, that this is where the faithful slave convey everything Jesus is telling them to Jehovah's Witnesses. With the public out of the loop on what Jehovah's Witnesses were really learning because they got their own edition. They could concentrate on those they already had trapped and were sitting in the Kingdom Hall. And after all, they apparently figured it out that the public can read a watchtower and know within seconds that the seven trumpet blasts mentioned in the book of Revelation, and uh, how do I put this, had nothing to do 
with a drunk guy screaming in Cedar Point, Ohio in 1922. <laughs> Something Jehovah's Witnesses, including this guy, listened to and accepted at so, so many Watchtower studies. So they started nixing the public's access to such delicious spiritual food, the main entree of the faithful and discreet slave, and they kept such nuggets of truth limited to those already under a spiritual food coma. Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> it's incredible. And a younger person may think, ah, yeah, it's always been this way for me growing up. Trust me when I tell you that was not the case for those of us that are at midlife. But I'll tell you, that isn't the most damning change to me. I have no explanation as to why Jesus waited well over a century to make this seemingly awesome change to his main teaching tool and meaning. No clue. I got nothing. What really blows my mind is the content of meetings, the content in their study materials, and the Watchtower currently being fed to 8 million loyal listeners, some of the dumbest stuff you'll ever read. I get that a cult would want to limit its overt stupidity to those on the outside, but the biggest change is what they're feeding those on the inside. The Watchtower used to feature series of articles that would feature, you guessed it, muddy waters. Their attempts to appear deep. For those of us old enough to remember, who can forget the subjects and the studies that would take three to four meetings It would last all month long just to cover the material because it was so deep? so important, new light and more. Or how about all the books going deep into the history of the Bible, of the organization, of archeology. span It had maps, we got the insight books and so much more. And look, it, hindsight's everything. Hindsight's everything. It was all very, very dumb. <laughs> it was dumb in our day too. But there was a pretense that it wasn't. There was this mm, quasi-effort to appear smart. Do you even remember those days in this organization? Because they're gone. Now to jog some memories, consider a few of their favorite subjects. Some of these are going to ring a bell with my generation. Some might shrug. They would pass this type of stuff off as insight from Jehovah himself. I just read it to you and take weeks, if not months to cover some of it. Here's some examples. This is going to take the place of my random thoughts this week. As a Jehovah's Witness and a Watchtower conductor, I lost track of studies, books, articles, talk outlines, and anything else that felt the need to take one more look at the Medes and Persians taking Babylon at night on dry riverbeds with the gates left open. You remember week after week of review of this story, slogging through endless dates and details with history and archaeologists proving that the dates we were being taught were wrong all along anyway, but it didn't matter. It all pointed to 1914, throw in a little 1919. Oh yeah, because every single story in history, the Medes, Persians, and Babylonians, was actually about them anyway. And by the time it was over, I literally would feel like I needed to name my only son Cyrus. <laughs> you know, if you know. <laughs> only to study it all over again a month or two later with a few different words and pictures a couple months later. But wow, we're so deep, aren't we? I can't begin to share the many endless side conversations and debates with fellow elders as to the significance of this story. An old-time Jehovah's Witness will remember it. You got Cyrus the Great. You got Babylon. You got them partying in there. You got fingers writing on walls. The gates are left open. They walk in. They conquer it. All, and it all points to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. It all points to a publishing company in New York. 
and we were exposed to it constantly. But what I'm really focused on is the fact that they tried to make it all seem deep. There was a pretense. They muddied the waters. How about Watchtower articles going well beyond any of Jesus' intentions that required the cutting down of thousands of trees to explain things like sheep gates? Remember the endless stories on the sheep and the goats and the sheep gates and who's the shepherd and who's the gate itself? On and on and on we'd go for weeks. Or how the Romans would be back to Jerusalem. They'd come in 66, but then they'd come back in 70 so the Jews better bust a move to the mountains or be caught inside when the Romans surround the city again, and how it all of this related to you and I. All of this gone over with a fine-tooth comb over and over and over again, depending on how long you were a witness. And we thought we were so deep and smart. Wow, these prophecies, I mean, unbelievable. Who to thunk it? The Romans surround Jerusalem all just to meet the needs of a publishing company in New York. That's what it's really about. Anyone else out there have several deep, oftentimes argumentative discussions about Gog, Magog, who the king of the north was versus who the king of the south was or is? Who can forget? Who can forget? From the time I was a kid, I heard our adults arguing about it in field service and from the back seat. And then as an adult, I got involved because we were scholars after all. And we were always up for a good debate when it came from the Bible. You're not likely to stumble into this awkward conversation as a JW today. I don't think it happens anymore. With several nations fragmenting and no one needs to keep themselves awake with a hearty, educated discussion in the field service anymore because they don't go in field service anymore. <laughs> so you know that this is disappearing and they're dumbing it down. This stuff isn't even content with them anymore. It's the type of stuff that is disappearing off the scene. Not completely. You know they're going to go back to it because they don't got anything else. They're working off an old book that hasn't really had any new stories in a while. <laughs> but what about the endless books in the book study we had to slog through? I was a book study conductor for all 11 years as an elder. You might remember, pay attention to Daniel's prophecy, where we took a deep look at Daniel's dreams, including months of studying what the statue was made of, how it symbolized different empires and kings, how the feet get smashed, and what it meant for you and I sitting there fiddling with our ties at the book study. Or how about the big tree dream? Remember that one? You remember. It gets cut down. It gets bound up. And we poured over every single detail like the scholars we thought we were back in the day <laughs> only to realize that when you left uh, Daniel is almost certainly a spurious book it has nothing to do with Jehovah's Witnesses and well my conclusion was the same Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar could have been buddies they could have been friends Daniel with his dreams and Nebuchadnezzar deciding to be an animal and eat grass for a while and well, if they ever existed at all, they were likely a couple of buddies that got into some real potent mushrooms. That was my conclusion. <laughs> but the point is that we made the effort on this stuff back in the day. We made every effort or pretense to appear deep, scholarly, students of the Bible, all of this, of course, only got worse with the two volumes of Isaiah, Light for All Mankind, Don't Even Get Me Started. We used to try to contain ourselves during the final prayer at the district conventions because we wanted to get in line for the next great scholarly publication from New York. I don't know what they're doing with that now, but trust me, back in the day, it was a thing. We couldn't wait. And we can't stop my list of random thoughts without asking who misses hearing about types or anti-types or typical versus anti-typical. How comical was all of that? How comical. But back in the day, under the influence of the guys that were the leadership then, Jehovah's Witnesses were exposed to this and boy, did we think we were smart. 
We did not see them overtly dumbing things down for us. We needed to know this stuff. And it's funny because in the 2014 annual meeting, David Splain, Jesus' brother and fellow king, got on stage and gave our generation an update on their favorite catchphrases of the past. If you haven't seen this, please go watch it. He says, quote, in the video on all things typical, anti-typical, he says, quote, let's get right into our subject, types and anti-types. Now, years ago, there it is, folks, our publications often applied certain Bible accounts and certain Bible characters as types of something greater. But you've noticed that uh, in recent years, that is seldom done. And the purpose of this talk is to explain why. End quote. 2014 annual meeting, David Splain, where he just admits that our generation, my generation, who was completely blindsided by endless types, anti-typicals and types and typicals, it sounds like a weird word, that they're not doing that anymore, you don't say. He goes on to say in this talk, well, we aren't the only ones to do the following, lumping themselves in with Babylon, the great and false religion. In the same talk, he admits, we're not the only ones who did that. Look at, the, look at Babylon, the great. W what? He admits it and says this, quote, please go watch this video yourself to see it is to believe it. Quote, now the study of types is not unique to Jehovah's Witnesses. During the past 2,000 years, Catholic and Jewish scholars have made quite a diligent study of types and anti-types. In fact, there is even a name for the study. They call it typology. Well, how would you sum this talk in a few words? The wrong answer is, we don't believe in types and anti-types anymore. We do! We certainly do! Where the scriptures identify them as such, we embrace them. But where the Bible is silent, we must be silent. End quote. That is directly from the talk by David Splain. Where he admits, oh yeah, we used to do a lot of that. We don't do that anymore. But don't blame us. All the guys we say are the most awful people on earth. False religion did it too. What? <laughs> And by stating so, he admits they're dumbing it all down. With that, gone is their attempt or their pretense to muddy the waters or to even attempt to be scholarly or sound scholarly. The groundwork has been laid from the stage for dumbing everything down. They're moving away from the idea that you need to be scholarly, you need to understand all these types, anti-types, illustrations, history, archaeology, and so much more, and dumb it down they have. And that's despite it all being ridiculous. They apparently were going to get out of the business of appearing to be smart. And then, of course, there's the attempts to teach us all what the book of Revelation means. A final random thought here. See a past episode, five books over many, many decades. But the amount of time we all wasted on some of the most insane stuff you'll ever read could have been the same time we were all getting master's degrees. It literally was that time consuming. We were drowning in this stuff. As I mentioned, five books, depending on your generation over the last century, with the last book on Revelation, oddly enough, being in 1988. Huh, not a word since. And isn't that interesting? When you're considering how they're dumbing everything down, they are now staying away from the book of Revelation. With Armageddon happening any second, it appears they have less to say. <laughs> because when you're dumbing things down, you don't want to revisit the ultimate example of dumb with grown adults talking about dragons and locusts and scorpions, how it relates to the book of Joel, ten horns, eight horns, seven heads, a couple of slots, you name it, it's all in there. And they're not even remotely commenting on anymore. Why? Because they've successfully dumbed down this religion. 
People that used to be curious about that now just sit there and nod their head to another music video. If you're old enough, it's not difficult to see that while they haven't completely eliminated studying their favorite prophecies and stories, they've dramatically moved away from where it was front and center, because it was in my day. And culturally, with passing generations, you're not likely to run into fellow Jehovah's Witnesses that even want to have deep conversations. Conventions, meetings, literature, all of it, made an absurd effort pretense, muddy waters, to appear scholarly. And in 2023, from where I sit, that dynamic is long gone among Jehovah's Witnesses. As a comparison, when I make a bold statement like that, I try to back it up. 2023. Take a look at what is featured on the website for the September 2023 study articles number 37 in the Watchtower magazine. One of the articles is entitled, <laughs> I'm going to try to keep it together, quote, rely on Jehovah as Samson did. <laughs> and, and there it is. I mean, I want to go right there. A deep dive on Samson? <laughs> we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna study Samson. They've done this stuff forever. But I think what's changed is that this is what they now emphasize. It's not the deep stuff. Or, or the pretense is the better way of saying it, of deep stuff. It's this now. We're going to take a look at Samson and what he means to you sitting in the audience. You take a Bible character, a character most scholars have recognized is completely influenced by Greek mythology, see Heracles, and then by the Roman version, see Hercules, Kids, that was more than a Disney cartoon, I promise. And they find a way to apply it to not only you and me, but, well, you guessed it, even Samson, Samson, is actually about them. Did you know that? <laughs> this is spiritual food at the proper time now. This is the main way the faithful slave is communicating with 8 million witnesses. We're going to unpack Samson. The study article for present Jehovah's Witnesses, this is September, just weeks ago, says stuff like this, quote, Samson, the name of this Bible character is known to many, even to people with little knowledge of the scriptures. His story has been featured by playwrights, songwriters, and movie makers. Yet the account of his life is no mere tale. We can learn much from this man of great faith, end quote. You might be wondering, Stacy, what can we learn? It continues, quote, You may have read of other instances when Samson performed amazing deeds. Single-handedly, he fought off a lion and later struck down 30 men in the Philistine city of Ashkelon. Samson knew that he could never have done such things without Jehovah's help. That was evident on one occasion when he became very thirsty after striking down 1,000 Philistines. What did he do? Rather than depend on himself to deal with his thirst, <laughs> he called out to Jehovah for help. Samson was energized after he drank the water that Jehovah provided. We do well to take advantage of the provisions Jehovah makes available to keep us spiritually strong, end quote. And there it is, the meaty, muddied waters of the teachings of today's Jehovah's Witness. And what a perfect example of how incredibly dumb it's all become. That last paragraph comes complete with a photo in the watchtower of Jeffrey Jackson of the governing body who apparently showed the strength of Samson when lying to the Australian Royal Commission about child safety. You see, Jeff, or so you're supposed to come away with as a witness there at the study that Sunday, Jeff himself is a lot like Samson only minus the hair, and, and minus Delilah, and, and minus the muscles. 
whatever, skip it all. Be like Samson. He was thirsty and so are you. Here is some of life's water free. <laughs> I know, sing along if you remember, old school, but it's all courtesy of Jeff and his friends. Be like Samson. Don't you feel well-fed spiritually? The waters went from muddy to absolute sludge. <laughs> Take a character and just talk about him killing a thousand people and that he got thirsty. And somehow, ladies and gentlemen, that's about nine guys in upstate New York. <laughs> there just isn't a pretense of being smart or deep or scholarly anymore. It's literally potato chips for dinner. With each passing decade, the literature has become increasingly juvenile. It features a grade school level of reading and writing. Pick up a watchtower at one of your local book carts. These comparisons to biblical characters has been around forever in Jehovah's Witnesses, with the governing body always being the greater Moses, the greater David, the greater Noah, the greater Samson, whoever. Pick someone. But it's gotten worse. I don't know how anyone could miss how much worse it's gotten. For example, take a look at the entire study edition I mentioned, September 2023 Watchtower, currently featured on their website to save lives. It's five articles that contain the following counsel. I'm summarizing. It's this. Article 1, be like Samson. Article 2, don't be like Jehoash. Article 3, don't be like Uzziah. Article 4, be like King David. And finally, Article 5, be like the Apostle Peter. There it is, food at the proper time in the month of September for Jehovah's Witnesses. The dumbing down is right underneath everyone's nose. And by the way, with that summary, you don't have to attend the meetings, nor do I encourage that. I seriously just summarized the five Watchtower studies from the month of September. I can't imagine conducting those all these years later. I found myself almost missing spending an hour talking about the King of the North and Gog of Magog like we used to in the old days where we thought we were so smart. I used to love this whole line of teaching. It always reminded me of reading Humpty Dumpty and applying it to not eating eggs because they have too much cholesterol, they're bad for you. Or how about Pinocchio and then applying it to the fact that crickets make good association. That's literally the level of juvenile teaching and publications that this organization is pumping out to millions now in the great dumb down. And as for the alleged smart literature of the past that many of us paid for, by the way, it too is obsolete, giving way to new light, including things like technology, a fancy website, a new television studio. And, and don't forget the theme park they're building, a theme park. <laughs> Again, they can always muddy the water with flashy technology, dramatic reenactments, and even have music videos for those of us who loved MTV and were there when it popped on the air. They leverage all of that now to seem deep. None of those things by which makes anyone think. It doesn't create teachers. It doesn't create people who at least have the pretense of being scholarly about the Bible. But I guess, aside from a rant, it, it, it's just worth noting that it hasn't always been this way. The subtle effort to dumb the flock down can also be seen in things we used to take for granted. I got a few examples on that. How about the elders? In my time as an elder, that was... You know, that was really held in high esteem. I'm sure it probably still is, although that's laughable. And it's laughable that we were too. Elders, though, used to have creative license with their public talk outlines. Any of my fellow elders out there? The time we would pour into a public talk outline? They used to be 45 minutes in my day. And not only is the creative license gone, but so is the 45 minutes. They're gone now. The outlines given to elders for Sunday meetings are manuscripts they just read them word for word and they're only 30 minutes long 
And if you deviate from the outline with that cool illustration you've been thinking about all week and boom, you're going to be in a council session with the elders after the meeting. <laughs> you're no longer a teacher as an elder. You're just a drone. Is it any wonder that the former in-depth, or so we thought, theocratic ministry school has morphed into something else entirely? It's really weird. And wow, public talks. I mean, looking back, public talks used to be full-scale events. Uh, I had the privilege, <laughs> see what I did there, of giving the special talk on more than one occasion. The special talk was the talk to the world that followed the memorial celebration a week or two later in the spring. And it always had this kind of intimidating vibe about it because you would spend the first 20 minutes of every outline bashing every other religion on earth, then have to make 607 BCE and 1919 somehow make sense. Uh, Chuck Russell had it so easy, I might add, with a ruler and a pyramid, didn't he? That's all he had to do. But we had to make it all work back in the day. And, and those days are gone too. It's funny because they no longer even try to measure pyramids or sheet pens or that time in the Finnish mystery. Remember that old book where they said Revelation 1420 predicted the precise distance from the place where the Finnish mystery was produced and printed in Stratton, Pennsylvania to its shipping destination in Bethel in New York City. If you'd like to see that insight, look to page 230 of the Finnish mystery. I'm, but look, I'm giving them an A for effort, <laughs> an A for effort in muddying the waters. But that pretense is long gone. But back in sticking to the world of congregation elders for a minute, you really see all the dumbing down when you look at the elder arrangement today, at least in my opinion. Gone is the idea that they have to be teachers in any way, shape, or form of God's word. And in is the emphasis on the organization, on procedures, on policies, on the legalities. And that used to be very, very different in my day. Now, I want to admit, I may have been one of those guys that was drawn to a group of elders or gravitated towards them um, that were a little more book smart or wanted to at least give off the air that they were. But it wasn't that uncommon back then. And I feel like it's very uncommon today. We would have long debates. We would have deep conversations following a watchtower study, sometimes lasting well into the evening if you got invited over after. And I saw even that sort of thing changing before I left. The majority of elders I served with were poor teachers. And they were often ill-prepared. And not just because they were great guys who just weren't good at that kind of thing. They just didn't even care to put in the effort. That may have been at least one reason why the governing body started to control any and all content at meetings, at least in my opinion. There was a time when elders were required to be good teachers and to be good speakers. And a lot of that is gone. And it's not a surprise as they desperately appoint any and all men willing to slave for the organization. They're, as you know, they're appointing kids in their 20s now. I'm going to throw myself under the bus here for a minute uh, because I always think it helps to, to do that. It, it's cathartic for me. I'm going to admit that. But it also just shows that I'm willing to share the mindset we had, this guy included, back in the day. I remember thinking I was so damn smart and not because I'm naturally gifted, but because I would work at it. And I'll tell you during one such watchtower study, I shared a point I was sure only I had ever thought of in the stream of time. And I'll tell you, I was really happy with the wows of the audience. I related my observation that when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, he'd done something very special not just raising him from the dead, more special than that. And I thought no one else had ever even realized it. You see, by resurrecting Lazarus then, in that moment, Lazarus went from being resurrected on earth and getting his own pets and a pair of pants 
No, Jesus gave his buddy the chance to live in heaven with Chuck Russell, Judge Joe, and Jesus himself by resurrecting him in that moment. Because we taught and learned that those that died before Jesus land on earth when they're resurrected, while those that died after Jesus join him in heaven. And boy, you should have seen me relating that. And I can still see two sisters that were very nice in the front row, just looking at each other with their mouths open like, I've never thought about that. They were just absolutely ecstatic with my comment, the gasps from the audience, and my own absurd sense of pride that I was indeed a scholarly shepherd. <laughs> and it was so absurd that I'm willing to share my own stupidity. It was ridiculous, so ridiculous that I remember it like yesterday. And it, it tells you the impression that the culture and the conditioning I'd been exposed to had done to my head, to my oatmeal brain. But there it is. Back in those days, we lived in a culture that encouraged us to give off the pretense of being smart. Today, there is no pretense. The muddy waters are even glanced at. <laughs> They've been successful in dumbing the entire culture and vibe in the organization down. And millions of Jehovah's Witnesses simply are accepting this today. Most haven't even noticed the dramatic changes to the curriculum, the culture, or anything else. And why would they? Why would they? They've been taught the following. Watchtower, February 15th, 1981, said this, quote, We all need help to understand the Bible, and we cannot find the scriptural guidance we need outside of the faithful and discreet slave organization. End quote. There it is. Whatever you're learning here is all that's important. Or how about this? The Watchtower, October 1st, 1994, page 8, where it said, quote, All who want to understand the Bible should appreciate that the greatly diversified wisdom of God can become known only through Jehovah's channel of communication, the faithful and discreet slave. End quote. I'm not sharing anything earth-shattering here. Jehovah's Witnesses, some of us listening, were conditioned to accept anything and everything that those guys say or do. Even if you've been around forever and you used to do a deep dive on seven-headed wild beasts and what every tooth in their mouth represents, but, but now you're listening to Watchtower study and on why you should give them your money. <laughs> That's the difference. And I know there are many who know what I speak of. We want to start numbering the hairs on the heads of beasts and how they correlate to today's political empire. Nah, the Watchtower now is just about how we need some money. <laughs> That's it. Dumbing it all down. You see it emphasized in the recent annual meeting meetings and convention parts that even they make mistakes in their teaching now and they don't even have to apologize for it or so they tell us we'll cover that another day. But the great dumbing down among Jehovah's Witnesses is real. I realize I've been out for 14 years, but where I see the dumbing down most evident is in their weekly habits, their weekly schedule. With Armageddon threatening to wipe us all out any second, maybe during this podcast, they canceled one of three weekly meetings. You remember it if you're old enough, the book study, which in my opinion was the closest environment to an old school Bible study as you could get. It was really that meeting that featured material on par with the Watchtower study. I mentioned earlier some of the books covered in the book study, many of which were ridiculous attempts to understand and apply the major and minor prophets of the Bible to Jehovah's Witnesses. You remember Daniel, Isaiah. There was even a book later on that had all the minor prophets in it. They, and they dumped it all. They dumped it all and encouraged what they call a family study night, leaving those of us who grew up around that to really scratch our heads and go, wait a minute. And by the way, family study night just meant that everyone watched reruns on TV, relieved to not be at another meeting. <laughs> That's all that that accomplished. 
but like the Watchtower study itself, like the elders, like so many of the culture, the, the lack of scholarly pretense, the book study and the books that were published specifically for it, they all just went away and the dumbing down continues. But I got to tell you, nowhere is the dumbing down more evident than in all things preaching. Gone is any pretense that they're Bible scholars let loose on the world with the word of God. That is gone. We've got to be just blunt about it. They continue to point to the fact that they alone have God's backing, and it's evident in the fact that they alone are preaching worldwide. Aside from the fact that that was never true and still isn't, one only has to look at the quality of their preaching efforts to see that the single most important work in the universe, saving lives, has also been grotesquely dumbed down in the last two to three decades. And this is despite the following. At Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 of the New World Translation, we get this, quote, For indeed, although you ought to be teachers in view of the time, you again need someone to teach you from the beginning the first principles of the sacred pronouncements of God, end quote. Teachers? In view of the time? Huh? I hereby issue a challenge. I challenge anyone to approach a Jehovah's Witness because that in itself proves how dumb it has become. You have to approach them. What? Standing in front of a book cart trying to outdo the Girl Scouts selling cookies at your local park but, but you have to approach them and ask them any Bible question. I challenge you to do that. Don't ask about their organization. That just causes them to pack up the cart and go to the car. I challenge you to ask them about doctrine. The Bible itself. Pick a subject. Ask them about the ransom. Ask them about anything. They can't answer them. They won't be able to answer almost anything you ask them. And I'm here to tell you, that didn't used to be that way. Approach any of them. They won't be able to answer your question. They will point at the book cart or tell you to visit their website. At most, they'll pull out a tablet and point at their literature, also features right next to them on that same book cart. It's absolutely embarrassing how inept and ill-prepared a Jehovah's Witness is to speak to anything. And I have to tell you, this is all a dramatic change for my generation, where being a student and being well-prepared was required. Didn't mean we always did it. Didn't mean we had anything right. It was all still stupid. But there was a pretense, there was a muddying of the waters to make it all seem deep. And today in 2023, Jehovah's Witnesses have been dumbed down so that they're nothing more than a mannequin. They stand there next to their own literature that they can't explain and in most cases have never read and they have no ability whatsoever to appear scholarly. The great dumbing down is most evident here, in my opinion, in the teaching and preaching. And, and remember, gone is the yearbook, and, and gone is now having to turn in field service time as of a few weeks ago. Now, the governing body is bragging about the following. On the website, under About Us Activities, our public ministry, you get this, quote, as of March 2015, 165,390 carts have been supplied to the congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses throughout the world. Thousands of stands, tables, and kiosks have also been acquired. End quote. What? Imagine bragging about this. An organization that used to stick its chest out and tell us all kinds of numbers is bragging about how many carts they've shipped. 
Gone is baptisms. Gone is conversations about memorial partakers. It, it, <laughs> in its place is exciting statistics on book carts. On book carts in the Great Dumbing Down. Under the News by Regent section of their site, we get this, quote, During the 2018 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games, which were held from February 9th through 25th, 2018, and March 9th through 18th, 2018, brothers and sisters in Korea engaged in a special campaign to offer the many international visitors Bible-based publications free of charge. Our brothers set up 152 public witnessing carts in 48 locations worldwide. Jehovah's Witnesses use over 300,000 carts to display their literature in over 35 countries. Listen to this. In this way, they are able to preach to people wherever they may be found and fully accomplish their ministry. End quote. What? Standing there as crowds came to celebrate truly brave people participating in athletic events while handicapped in Korea. Jehovah's Witnesses are told they're fully accomplishing their ministry by standing next to a book cart as these people walk by. Forget the irony of leveraging an event to honor the accomplishments of handicapped athletes in 2018 in Korea and calling it fully accomplishing their ministry. I'm guessing when I think about it that past Jehovah's Witness pioneers who can remember the term coal porters, people who spent hundreds of hours preaching, going out into farmland and into lands where their lives were in danger, and so many others would be horrified to learn that this is what all their sacrifices of the past led to. People standing at an event for handicapped people next to a book cart. It's all been dumbed down beyond words. A minister of Jehovah as of 2023 is someone that can push a book cart to a crowded area, stand there unable to answer a basic Bible question, and point to a website. That's it, folks. To even argue the fact that this hasn't been dumbed down would be fascinating to me, and I'm up for it. But what they're bragging about now is how many book carts are out there. And I come from a time when we used to brag about how many lives we saved, or so we thought. How many Bible studies. It didn't matter. It sure doesn't matter now. But you might be asking, how did, this how did this happen? You call it the great dumb down, and why? Well, I want to admit, as I did from the outset, that my answer is colored a bit by my own experience. In my opinion, and this may be semi-new information for younger generations, I think the entire culture of Jehovah's Witnesses began to change when Fred Franz died. It took a few decades to catch up, but they ran out of guys like him who looked like eccentric sages touched with Holy Spirit when they were just touched with some mental illness. Most of these in leadership positions and then the governing body in 1971, they're company men. They don't particularly appear or even try to be scholarly. They're men who know how to run printing presses or former circuit overseers. The guys in charge now are guys that grew up under that old school crew led by Freddie Franz but if you notice, compared to the times of years, decades gone by, these guys just don't appear very bright. Despite what many believe, a lot of these guys land in their positions the same way an elder in a local congregation gets appointed. So my answer, my answer number one, is that they just don't have any weirdos like Fred Franz around anymore. They just don't have him. And there's a tremendous history behind that man and where he got a lot of his teachings from. But with him, in my opinion, went the illusion of depth in this religion and all those crazy watchtower studies. But my second opinion is more of a question, I guess. I find myself wondering if we can blame the legal department 
for some of the dumbing down of Jehovah's Witnesses. The weird world of Freddy has landed the modern day organization in a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. Freddy was a bit of a nut, but he didn't really teach them how to be practical in a world that was changing. While Freddy and his guys were busy telling us what ten horns on a seven-headed beast were, the world stopped ignoring their nonsense and started looking closely at what was going on in their organization. And that includes, by the way, former Jehovah's Witnesses, some that may be listening. I'll tell you, in my opinion, the guys currently in charge are laying the groundwork for the future. And they're doing it by keeping Jehovah's Witnesses dumb. They're rolling out talks and backtracking on comments about things they couldn't possibly have the answer for and never did. They made moves to introduce outs on all of Freddy's stupidity of the past. As an example, the lame attempt to introduce blood fractions as an option to not taking a transfusion. That was a response to something they can't change without an avalanche of lawsuits, but they wanted to appear smart because Jehovah talked a lot about blood fractions in his holy book. <laughs> they were fixing Freddy's stupidity. They're rapidly mothballing meetings and publications and handing out Jehovah's Witness Apple iMac tablets or whatever they are and handing out a website, website URL. That's what they're doing. Meeting content is under their full control now. They're dumbing it all down. Right under 8 million plus noses. The great dumb down. That's what I call it. But for me, based on my age, I just find myself wondering how the older generations of Jehovah's Witnesses are reacting to all of this. Are they just too tired to care? I kind of think they are. They've survived so much in that organization. And now they find themselves living through the great dumb down. I have to believe that some of them are not accepting it at the heart level, but they're just pushing forward because that's all they've ever known. We'll talk about that in the future. But like I said early on, I've always loved Nitschke's quote. They muddy the waters to make it seem deep. But again, as a classic overthinker, I'm going to take that quote a step further and often have. I've decided personally to ask every Jehovah's Witness I encounter just one question. Just how deep is a mud puddle? I want to thank you for being here. Wherever you may be, be well. <laughs>